coming up on Chopper's Politics. I was a much younger official and the Boris was a much younger journalist and we were together almost every day in the press room. As you know, I mean, there's always a good relationship or at least a lively relationship <laughs> between spokespeople and journalists. I'm Christopher Hope, the Telegraph's chief political correspondent, and this is Chopper's Politics. So it's back to Zooms. And as we reach almost two weeks into this third national lockdown, in England at least, my dream of getting back anywhere near the Red Lion pub is edging further into the distance. But I am very aware that I'm lucky to be at home with my family and my lovely dog Queenie, who you may have heard made a small but important appearance during my chat with Nigel Farage in my last podcast. Not everyone is so fortunate, of course, and for some, the next few weeks and months will be very, very difficult. Later in this podcast, I'll be talking to Diana Barron, Baroness Barron, the Minister for Loneliness, about how we can help each other during this lockdown, when it's so easy to feel isolated. But first, just two weeks into our new relationship with Brussels, I got the chance to talk to our first ever EU ambassador to the UK, Joa Valle de Almeida. So listeners, we're going back to our Brexit podcast roots as I join the ambassador to talk about special relationships, ham sandwiches at border posts and working with a very young and tousled haired Boris Johnson many years ago. Well, we got there. Mr. Ambassador, the first ambassador to Britain for the European Union. How was your Brexit? Well, I think we all had a feeling of relief. I certainly did have because it was a long process. A long negotiation and an intense negotiation, quite a unique process. So I was relieved. I was happy. I was happy to see it uh, over and done. And most of all, looking forward to the future. Uh, you know, that's that's the state of mind in which I am right now. Of course, and we'll, we'll come on to the future shortly, but let's just deal with the past before that. The deal that was negotiated, it's a fairer one to Britain, would you now say? I think it's fair for both sides. Otherwise, I don't think uh, we would have both of us signed it. You know, sometimes we are tempted to say we won, uh, they lost and things like that. That's not our state of mind. And that's uh, that's not what you expect from from here from us. I think I think the winners are our citizens and our businesses, because, first of all, they avoided a no deal. And, and that I think even if, you know, may, some people may have preferred it, but I don't think it was a realistic way forward. Uh, it will cause more problems uh, to everybody. So I think avoiding the deal was a good thing and creating a framework for our future relationship is so important. It gives uh, certainty, predictability for people, and it's a, a sort of blueprint on which we can build our future relations. So uh, I think uh, for all those reasons, I think it was a good and balanced deal. The British government, the British people made a choice. We respected that. And then the question was, in the last few months, a very intense and complex negotiations to find the best modalities to accommodate the choice that uh, the UK had made without putting in question our own interests, of course. And fundamentally, for instance, the integrity of the single market. And this, I think, was achieved. And that's why we have a deal. And I'm happy for that. You say you respected the result, but was there any point since uh, June 2016 when the European Union were trying to worry about whether there could be a second vote in Britain um, to overturn the first one? Or did you accept it from day one? You said, no, that's it, you're off, we get it. Deal with what you have, and we deal with the British authorities, the Prime Minister, the government, the cabinet. Uh, We, in full respect of the positions of the parliament, this is how you, you, you deal in international relations. There's no room for speculation or for hopes or, or, or otherwise feelings and emotions about it. We have to be pragmatic. Uh, what was at stake was a very, uh, very important relationship, right? We are your most important trading partner. You are our third most important trading partner. We have been living together for almost half a century. We share values. We share strategic interests. Our families are you know, interconnected. Our businesses are interconnected. We have a common history. We cannot change a geography. So for all these reasons, there was a very strong case for us to, once Brexit was accepted as a reality, there was a strong case for us to go as far as we could in managing a good deal. And that's and I must pay tribute to, to the negotiating teams, David Frost, Michel Barnier, to our leaders, particularly the Prime Minister and the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. I think they did a good job. 
And uh, we still on our side need uh, the ratification of the European Parliament, as you know. So the process is not completely over yet. But once that is done, and I hope it will, we have to start this new journey together. And I'm looking forward to it. In terms of those personalities, you got to know, did you, join the four-year negotiation, uh, Lord Frost, Latterly, Ollie Robbins originally. Do you speak to them? You, you exchanged Christmas cards? Uh, both good friends, and uh, I respect them immensely. They are uh, you know, great negotiators, great civil servants. You know, don't forget that uh, we were for many decades uh, on the same side, and we were working together in making the, the union a progress. I'll give you one example, the internal market. The single market, which well is one of the jewels in our crown, has been impacted, immensely impacted, by the contribution of the United Kingdom. And many colleagues of, of mine are working on that from the British side. So I want to pay tribute to the contribution of the UK for the, what the European Union is today, because it's uh, the result of a collective effort. So all those colleagues that you mentioned and many more are among my friends, and I'll continue to engage with them in this next phase of our relationship. You mentioned there some of the advisors, but you also knew Boris Johnson, didn't you? Because 30 years ago, you were a young, obviously ambitious and a brilliant young spokesman for the European Commission. And he used to speak to the press corps in Brussels when Boris Johnson was my colleague at The Telegraph. Well, uh, this was a long time ago, my friend. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, this was uh, 30 years ago. We're talking about the very early 90s. And I was, in fact, a, a much younger uh, official, and uh, Boris was a much younger journalist. <laughs> and we were together almost every day in the press room. And uh, like, as you know, I mean, there's always a good relationship, or at least a lively relationship between <laughs> spokespeople and journalists. Uh, we were actually, you know, friends at the time, and we had a lively relationship. So uh, good memories of those days. Did you have any, any big rows about Brussels bananas being made straighter or any of the stories he used to produce the Telegraph? No, not, not. Uh, at the time, <laughs> th that time we were, we had a problem in our main building, the Berlemont building, you know, the iconic yeah. building, uh, because we, we found asbestos there and we were in the process of leaving. So one of the stories of that time that I remember was a whole process of leaving, of, of evacuating. And of course, uh, Boris Johnson, journalist at the time, it was, as always, uh, uh, very, very, very creative about all that. So we, we had good exchanges about that. That's well, one of the things I remember, but there were many, you know, on a daily basis in the, in the press room like that, you have all these stories. Do you think in any sense Brexit was inevitable? I mean, Britain was a big part of getting the common market together, but when it became a project of greater political union, that surely was where Britain started to disengage at some level. Well, if you, if you look back at the history of the European Union, the European communities first and then the European Union, again, a great contribution for Britain, but also always a specific sort of positioning as far as the process uh, was concerned. From that sense, there was always creativity on the British side, all these new initiatives, always a, a slightly different point of view coming to the discussions which was an enrichment for our collective exercise. But of course, uh, there was always a doubt or a, a questioning about their full involvement in the most sort of ambitious uh, projects. They didn't go into the single currency, for instance, is a good example, uh, and in a few others. No, I don't think that it was written in stone that they will leave. I think it came uh, to a large extent as a surprise, and certainly as a, as a sad surprise. But it's something that we uh, very, very quickly accepted as a democratic decision. And our focus moved immediately towards, let's find the best ways for this, for this divorce and for the future relationship. You know, my point is, is very clear. For me, that is life after Brexit. It will be a different life, right? It will be very different from a membership of the European Union. It will be more complicated in some, in some areas, but there's still life uh, ahead of us. Just a final point on the Brexit talk. Do you think that the European Union helped make it a difficult negotiation to put off the other 27, some of whom may want to also leave the European Union? It was such hard work, wasn't it? Perhaps that was to encourage les autres. Right after Brexit, I was serving in, at the United Nations in, in 2016. It came as a shock, let's be clear. It was the first time a country decided to leave the European Union. And, and not any country, right? So it came as a shock. There was an element of surprise. There was an element of sadness and, and grief, I would say. And uh, there were concerns, and I don't want to hide them because they're public, of this becoming a, a situation in which this could encourage other countries to consider that. 
there were these doomsday scenarios about, oh, this is only the beginning of the collapse of the European Union. Many more countries will follow Britain. Well, that is not what happened. On the contrary, this created a feeling that nothing should be taken for granted, that uh, the benefits that country have from belonging to the Union, they could be in question if there was not a sense of, of concentrating on our common goals. And in fact, if you look at the opinion polls since then, they went up in terms of support for the European Union among member states. You have no country thinking even remotely of leaving the European Union right now. And in fact, the state of our union today is maybe even better than four years ago. Can you understand why people in Britain voted to leave the European Union? Well, first of all, I, I respect democratic decisions. No question. I, I know if, that. If, if people decide in a majority way to leave, they must have their reasons. And I have to respect that. Do you understand those reasons, though? I try to understand those reasons, but I'm still in the, in the initial phase of my learning curve, uh, having been in the UK only for one year. And I'm trying to understand deeply uh, or more deeply what, what the, these reasons are. But I respect them. And that's the first approach to it. I think if you listen to all 200 episodes of Chopper's Politics, you might learn about it. Well, I'm, I'm learning every day, Chris, and also I've been learning from you as well. But again, I'm, I'm now focused on, on the future. Now, listen, in terms of that future, is Brexit going OK at the moment? There's been talk this week of lorry drivers having their ham sandwiches removed from them in Holland because they're <laughs> inadvertently importing some, uh, some luncheon meat that may not have been through customs. Is that not the right approach, surely? Well, I think we, we should be clear about the, the point I made earlier. Things will never be the same as they were when the UK was a member. And uh, you knew that, we knew that, everybody knew that, or at least I hope that everybody knew that. It's a ham sandwich, though. No, because it, it's, about, it's about the control of the borders. It's about the fact that if you are a third country, and if the third country which chose to leave the single market and leave the customs union, as you know, there were alternative options available for the UK. But the choice was made on, on an option that excludes participation in the single market and customs union. That means that you have to be treated like any other third country, meaning entering the internal market, you have to have controls and checks uh, of different nature, including phytosanitary nature. Is that proportionate? I mean, two weeks ago, we were part of the European Union. It's, a, it's in a, a lunchbox and it's being opened and you can't take the ham sandwich. I mean, well, I don't want to comment a particular case of which I'm not aware, but let, let me put it this way. There's another element in the first weeks, right? And you have to understand on both sides. Yeah. People are still adapting, administrations, uh, customs, uh, officers, police, business people, lorry drivers. You know, all of us are still adapting to a new situation. Well, were you surprised that, that 4 million EU nationals have applied for settled status in Britain to become essentially Britons as well as EU nationals? It's quite a big number. It's quite a lot of people there. Quite a big number. I'm very proud of the EU citizens yeah. in the UK, I must say, very clearly. And uh, the, the contribution they make to, to the, the British economy, the British society. I was extremely proud to see a Portuguese nurse uh, helping the prime minister uh, dealing with COVID. I think it's a good symbol of our contribution. And, and I'm happy to see that the great majority uh, of our citizens have already enrolled in the settled status uh, system. Yep. I'm encouraging all the others that have not yet done so to do so. We have still six months to, to do that. And we are working well with the Home Office and the Foreign Office in making sure that this happens in a, in a smooth way. And there's been no problems from your point of view, no issues there? No big issues. Uh, we are worried by people who are a bit in the margins of electronic uh, media and things like that. And we are trying to reach out to them. But I think overall, this is going uh, relatively well. And I'm very happy that a large majority of, of citizens, EU citizens, will remain in the, in the UK. The same for British citizens in our countries. I, I have two neighbours in, in the south of Portugal, both coming from the UK, uh, and I hope they will stay for many years there. And, and I think this is part of the deal we made, the withdrawal agreement, uh, and I think it's very important for the, the future of our relations that these communities of citizens on both sides continue to contribute to their respective hosting countries. In terms of the next few months, so what's occupying your time? We need to get a degree of agreement on, on services, don't we? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, this this is a complex deal, uh, 1,200 pages. I'm sure you read all of them. Oh, yes. 
every line. Um, so there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to, to implement. There will be a number of committees, joint committees, uh, deadlines, review clauses. So I think uh, I can guarantee you that we will continue talking. In some areas, we will continue negotiating the developments that come, you know, start from this agreement. You mentioned financial service. We are negotiating. We started this week a negotiation of a memorandum of understanding on regulatory cooperation. We need uh, these kind of issues to develop. So there's still a lot to go on. But if I have to identify priorities, I would say, first of all, uh, we need to make sure that we help our citizens and our business on both sides to benefit from the deal. There are economic opportunities there to be used. Secondly, as I said earlier, global challenges. You know, if I look at 2021, in Britain, I see your presidency of the G7 Mm -hmm. and uh, your hosting of the COP26 for climate change. I mean, two big international gatherings on which I think we can play a role. I give you an example of the G7. There are nine people at the table. Uh, Five of them come from the European Union, and then there is the Prime Minister Johnson. If we join efforts, we are six out of nine. I'm sure six can impact on what the nine will decide. Yeah. Uh, And lastly, I think we need to work with other partners. We cannot do this alone. And the whole multilateral agenda, now working with the new American administration, but also, you know, discussing uh, how we deal with with other big players, China, Russia, and others. Uh, How we engage with Africa, which is, of course, a major a major partner for our for our future. And overall, in foreign policy and security, how can we, uh, you know, make sure that we together promote our common values? and look after our common interests. So I think I won't be bored in the next few months and years. No. I can guarantee that. We, we have a lot of, lot of company bosses listen to this podcast, directors, that kind of thing. They're worrying about the red tape issues if they're exporting to the European Union. What reassurance can you give to them that those, those teething issues at the moment will disappear? With due respect, they have to do their homework together with the British administration to see exactly what they need to do to prepare and to get ready for uh, the new reality, which is, again, less favorable for trade than the previous one, but still much better than the no deal uh, with tariffs and quotas. So we are... We are where we are as a result of the, the decision to live in the terms that Britain has decided. We now need to adapt to that. What are the odds on getting a deal on financial services, do you think? No, we are not talking about a deal. Huh? We are talking about uh, a memorandum of understanding on regulatory cooperation, it's something we have with the United States. So okay. it's, not, uh, it's not a deal, I understand. Uh, it's not a deal. We have on both sides the capacity to take unilateral decisions on equivalents and others. And both sides will retain that power. Uh, so that's not part of any negotiation. So I think I think we'll come to good terms in in regulatory cooperation. I don't think anyone wants to create more obstacles than than there should be. But we retain the autonomy to make uh, our own decisions on both sides regarding that. Do you think the UK and European Union can forge a a close relationship, maybe even as close as the one that uh, America has with Britain, this so-called special relationship? Well, I... I was ambassador in the U.S., and uh, I'm I'm aware of your links uh, with the United States, which go back a long time and for very good reasons. We also have a special relationship with the United States. You are our closest partner. There is zero kilometers distance between you and us in, in the island of Ireland, and only a few kilometers across the channel. Our economies are interlinked, interdependent, interconnected. Our peoples, our families are interlinked. So obviously we have to have a special relationship. I can't imagine anything different from that. But if I look at the the U.S. side, and the U.S. has been on the news for good and bad reasons, uh, I also see a potential for cooperation among the three of us, the EU, the U.K., and the U.S. And uh, in in the multilateral level, for instance, where we, uh, with the new administration even more so, we have common ground, but also now the issues dealing with the the problems of the world, the global challenges. We mentioned climate. We can think about terrorism, cybersecurity, migration, and other issues that uh, need uh, collective solutions, but also in dealing with other partners. And some of those partners do not necessarily share our values, and they have uh, competing strategic interests. So there again, I see a ground for cooperation. I think we have... We could be at uh, at the start of a new cycle, 
a new dawn in the EU UN, UK relations, I believe. Uh, the life after Brexit I was referring to earlier. There's a great potential uh, here, and uh, I think we should invest in it. And uh, for, for many, many reasons, from the business sector to the human rights dimension. In this country, obviously, we're all dealing with a global pandemic at the moment, and Britain was able to move quite quickly as a sovereign nation to get these vaccines. The European Union didn't clear those vaccines as quickly. Is, is that an argument, do you think? I mean, it's been seen here as an advantage of Brexit because we weren't, didn't have to go at the pace of the European Union. You know, I don't want to comment on, on the situation in Britain, but that, uh, on, the, on the EU side, now, let me give you this perspective. We are 27 countries. Some are bigger than others. Some have more uh, financial potential than others. Some have more bargaining power than others if they have to engage individually with uh, the providers of vaccines. We decided otherwise. We said we need to approach this together in full solidarity so that we allow each of our countries, 27 of them, to have the same chance and the same opportunity to have access to vaccines in due time. And that's what we did. And we have now more than 2 billion doses for 450 million people. That's quite a potential. Of course, the downside of this big purchasing operations is that uh, you know, the producers of vaccines have some difficulty in following uh, all the demand that exists around the world. And uh, and that explains that sometimes you don't get the vaccines when we want, uh, but we are making an enormous effort. The vaccination has started at the same time for or more or less for all the countries. We are making good progress there. And uh, I'm sure at the end of the day, this will prove to be the right approach. And just as finally, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you for your time, uh, people like Nigel Farage predict that other countries like Italy might one day leave the European Union. Do you think in 10 years' time there will still be 27 members of the EU? Maybe 20 years' time? Let me give you a, a personal perspective of this. When I arrived in the US as EU ambassador in 2010, we were at the heart of the, what people called the euro era crisis, which was not an euro era crisis, but still. And the question I had every day in 2010, 2011, Ambassador, are you still around? Is there still a European Union? Who's going to leave next? Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Ireland? You may, well, it never happened. It never happened. Uh, the euro is still there. There are more num- members of the euro now than in, in, uh, in 2010. And nobody left. Uh, so the doomsday scenarios... Uh, they don't necessarily realize in, in the European Union. So, uh, you know, when we started COVID, the COVID crisis, people will say, well, this will be the, really the end. See what we agreed in July, a new innovative, unprecedented financial package recovery schemes that we are now implementing this year. So, I mean, we can surprise people and uh, I'm sure we will surprise Mr. Farage. <laughs> well, on that note, and best of luck to the European Union and to the UK as we go our different ways for a bit. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, stay with us. In just one moment, we'll be having a change of pace on this podcast. And I'll be talking about the toll that lockdowns are having on mental health with the government's loneliness minister, right after this. Motherhood. It's a seriously full-on job. Late nights, early mornings, a difficult client. Hi, I'm Claire Newell. I'm the investigations editor at The Telegraph. I've spent my career flying around the world investigating corruption. Last year, my latest adventure was having our baby boy. And as I started to emerge from all the sleep deprivation, I started to question, was I going to be able to continue my career while looking after our boy? To find out, I made a podcast called The Juggling Act. I'll be interviewing politicians, chief execs, celebs, to ask them how having a baby has affected their careers, their relationships and their lives. Yes. To find the show, search for The Juggling Act from wherever you normally find your podcasts and click subscribe. And we're back. Now, England currently is in its third national lockdown. We're being told to isolate as far as possible to stem the spread of coronavirus. But this can, of course, come with an unwanted side effect. 
loneliness. Now, The Telegraph has just launched a new campaign called Mental Health Emergency, a drive to keep the nation's mental well-being firmly in the spotlight. And who better right now to talk about that on this podcast than Diana Barron, Baroness Barron, the loneliness minister. And given we're talking about mental health, I thought I'd just start by asking her how she is. Baroness Barron, the loneliness minister, welcome to Chopper's Politics. How are you? I am very well and lovely to talk to you. What do you think is the toll of loneliness on Britain? Is there a cost to society? I mean, there are sort of formal academic assessments of the cost of loneliness to society. But I think in a pandemic, it's at a much more human and immediate level than a kind of academic calculation. And I believe that pretty much every one of us and every one of your listeners has either felt lonely in the last few months at some point or has worried about a friend or a loved one or a neighbour who they believe is lonely. So I think it's touched every one of us during the pandemic. Is it a peculiarly British problem, do you think? There's more multi-generational families, aren't there, in in other countries. Do you think we're more lonely here? I really don't think that's true. I mean, what's quite interesting, and I'm this is not the thing I'm proudest of, but when I was appointed loneliness minister, I didn't assume that it would be perhaps the thing that took so much of my time. And I can tell you that my inbox is fuller on the subject of loneliness, just from the general public, from journalists, academics, all ages and all around the world. I get asked all the time about our work on this area. So I think it's something that resonates from the US to Japan to Germany all over. Why do you think you sit in the culture department, not in the health department? Well, I think the role, like many, could sit in a number of departments. And if you look at loneliness through a kind of connection with mental health lens then, you know, your question's right. Why not put it in health? But I think we've tried very much to try and focus on the solutions to loneliness. And a lot of those solutions about human connection sit within the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, whether it be through culture, which is a connector, sport is a connector, the voluntary sector does amazing work in this area and, you know, digital connections are essential. Do you think it is a a young person's issue as much as an older person's problem, being lonely? It's one of the things I think that surprises people that actually feelings of loneliness are consistently highest among young people and obviously very high right at the moment because of all the disruption that they've experienced. So it definitely is an issue for young people, in part perhaps because as you get older, you become sort of more able to cope with it. But I think, you know, I've been talking to young people recently about loneliness. And one of the things that struck me was they felt they would be more embarrassed to admit that they were lonely than to admit they had a mental health problem. They felt there was more stigma around being lonely than having a mental health issue, which I thought was kind of shocking, actually. That is, that is shocking. And why is it? Because it's the idea you have no friends, I suppose. That, that's, I guess they're, Therefore, so. you're unpopular. Yeah. And- And I think that's one of the things we've really been trying to tackle in the work that we've been trying to do with our Let's Talk Loneliness campaign is to sort of say, you know, all of us, if we feel lonely, or many of us, will start by saying, you know, what have I done wrong? This must be my fault. It's something wrong with me. And actually, it's not. It's a natural human condition. And one of the simplest, best things you can do is talk about it and Certainly from my experience, if you do talk about it, the first thing that happens is people share their experience of loneliness. So there is something fundamentally quite healing when you talk about it. Do you worry most about the children uh, in this pandemic in terms of loneliness? You know, that's such a hard question. I was thinking before we spoke about the people who've really touched me the most. And I do, of course, worry about the children, but I also spoke to a young mother who'd had her baby sort of days into the first lockdown and her this was at the end of November I think I spoke to her and you know her young child had not played face to face with another 
child throughout the whole year for certain reasons she had to be shielding and the idea that you've got nearly a one-year-old who's never played with another child but equally elderly people who are frail and perhaps have their spouse or loved one in a care home and can't go and see them you know there are so many stories as you know so there's plenty of room for worry in all of this There's but we plenty. are also trying to focus genuinely in all seriousness you know on the one hand this is an issue that affects so many of us and some people really terribly but on the other hand it is one of the very few things that every single one of us can do something to help you know a small thing like pick up the phone or write a card or a letter or send an email any one of those things will make a difference to somebody's day and will, you know, help us as individuals too. I mean, it could be a neighbour, it could be a friend, it could be a relative, it could be a complete stranger. If you see someone when you're out walking your dog or whatever and smile and chat, you just make a connection for the day. Now, Baroness Barron, we've launched at the Telegraph a campaign called Mental Health Emergency about the damage to mental health during this lockdown. And a lot of that, of course, is about loneliness. Now, here's a clip from my colleague, Brianie Gordon, earlier this week on Five Live. The thing that all mental health issues have in common, from anxiety through to psychosis and beyond, is that they isolate you. They work by telling you you're a freak, telling you're, you that you, you, you're alone and telling you that no one's going to understand what you're going through. Lockdown is basically state-sanctioned isolation, right? And it obviously feeds into the very worst parts of our brain. And I can see how detrimental lockdowns are for people's mental health. That was Brianie Gordon on Radio 5 Live earlier this week. Now, there's a lot of talk about stopping people going for a walk at the moment. That's, that's the next maybe big thing. You can't go for a walk to meet with a friend. And yet catching COVID-19 is harder indoors, not outdoors. What would your response be as the loneliness minister if the government moved to do that? Well, I mean, the government would only move to do that if there was an incredibly strong reason from the public health data. And that's why... It's so vital, I know you've heard it a hundred times, but it is so vital that everybody sticks to the current rules. We do believe the current rules are sufficient and we also know that the vast, vast majority of people are sticking to them, but we all need to do so. We've really tried to protect people's right to exercise each day, whether that be walking or running or cycling. And, you know, that that's not the case in all countries. And we've done that in the very clear awareness of the importance of that for all our mental health of being out of doors and being able to take exercise. So that, that wouldn't change without incredibly powerful reasons to do so. And when they make that choice, are they thinking about the impact on mental health of people being made to isolate even more than they are already? I mean, of course, there are so many moving parts to these decisions. And, you know, you'll appreciate they're made many levels above my pay grade. But yes. we have to think about the mental health of, you know, all of us and our need to be outside. But we also need to think of the mental health of doctors and nurses working under extraordinary pressure for sustained time. So it's balancing all of those different things. And all of us, goodness knows, we all hope and believe that this vaccine rollout will mean that we will be emerging, unwrapping, I think the Prime Minister says, unwrapping ourselves uh, in a matter of weeks. And, and, you know, that's something really to kind of work towards. Yes, quite. Let me play you a second clip now from Charles Walker MP, Sir Charles Walker MP, the Vice Chairman of the 1922 Committee of Backbench Tory MPs in the House of Commons last week. The next three months are going to be really, really hard for a lot of people, a lot of people who don't have my advantages, my advantage of a monthly salary, a monthly pension payment. These are people who are going to be worrying about their jobs, about their future, about their mental health, about their family relationships, because they will miss people terribly, or they will be in very small environments where apparently they can only leave to exercise once a day, once a day, and then Sadly, some of these people are going to break and it's going to be too much for them. And that is when we in this place, the journalists up there with all their privileges, instead of sneering and dismissing them, 
instead of calling them COVID idiots, should show some compassion and understanding. Would you agree with, with Charles Walker there, Baroness Baron? Well, he makes an incredibly powerful point, and I think we don't really get much further forward if we spend our lives judging one another. None of us are perfect. You know, he certainly makes a very, very powerful point about the impact on our mental health. I mean, he was saying, let's not be quick to judge people who are going out. Let's not accuse them of being COVID idiots. Let's not use, I'm a privileged journalist. You're a privileged uh, a minister. Let's not judge other people's lives through our lenses. Did you agree a bit with that? Well, I mean, I think I, I say this on a very personal level. I just don't think it gets you further forward judging people. I think let's think about our humanity. That's a better place to start. We can all do something individually to help our communities through this pandemic by sticking to the rules and by reaching out to those around us. And if we each did that every day, we would be emerging sooner. So what's your advice then to staving off loneliness? Think about the smallest possible thing you can do that will make a difference. Because what we need is to sustain these efforts. Just say, I'll do a phone call a day or three phone calls a week, whatever is manageable for you in the short term. But I think just trusting that reaching out and talking to other people will help them and will help you is a pretty sound basis on which to start. And then I think for those who are able to and can do so safely, I genuinely think, and the evidence backs this up, that if you can volunteer in your community, it really is so rewarding. I have never spoken to a volunteer who doesn't say that they have got so much more out of it than they put in. And nowadays, there are loads of opportunities to volunteer online, to volunteer by phone. We've recently funded a number of befriending projects where older and younger people, for example, with shared interests are linked up and they speak regularly on the telephone. And then as we come out of the pandemic, we're going to be spending £4 million for groups inspired by people that I've met around the country who are running baking groups and walking groups and painting groups and some of them they're doing online and some of them obviously are on hold until after the pandemic but we just think that thing that you walk down the street to and it doesn't say this is a loneliness club over the door it says this is something you enjoy doing over the door and guess what you'll meet people who enjoy the same thing and it will serve to reduce loneliness so I call it a kind of Trojan horse approach I think to be sustainable, it's got to be something you enjoy doing and is entirely manageable and build from there. Baroness Barron, the government's loneliness minister, thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Thanks so much. And during my chat there with Baroness Barron, you heard that clip of my colleague, Telegraph columnist Bryony Gordon. And guess what, podcast fans? Bryony has her own podcast called Mad World, in which she talks to guests openly and honestly about their mental health. She's even spoken to a certain Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry, and Nadia Hussein from Bake Off, Stephen Fry, and nurses on the front line. I really heartily recommend having a good listen to her back catalogue if you need some company over this dreadful lockdown. Do search Bryony Gordon's Mad World wherever you listen to your podcasts and I'll put a link to that show in the show notes for this episode. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you to my guests, Ambassador Joao Valle de Almeida and Baroness Barron. Thank you to my producers, Elliot Lampett, Louisa Wells and Theo Luludis. If you've enjoyed this show, please do consider supporting our journalism. Go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper where you can get your first month's subscription completely free and after that just £2 a week. Without our subscribers, we couldn't make podcasts like this one. And if you can, we'd love it if you can give this show a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Just like the saucily named Knickers Model Zone did. They said, Chopper digs deeper into the topics of the week, and I've come to learn far more about the Westminster engine. Well, thank you, Knickers Model Zone. Your reviews do help other people find this podcast. And I love your name, by the way. 
Do get in touch if you want. Please email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or find us on Twitter at Choppers Podcast. We love your suggestions for topics and guests. And of course, please do buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph newspaper if you can. Until next time, cheerio!